All right. Hello, everyone. We'll get started. Welcome to How Revenue Councils Can Improve Marketing Performance. We're really excited that you have been able to join us today. I know you could be probably doing a lot more things with your time, so we appreciate it. My name is Katie, and I'm going to be moderating today's event. Um, but before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. So first of all, this webinar is being recorded, so we will be sending that recording to you after the webinar, so be sure to look out for that. You'll probably get it in your inbox tomorrow morning. Um, all attendees are muted, so if you do have questions, please feel free to put those in that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or the chat box, and we will be sure to get to those questions at the end of the session. All right, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. First, we have Terry Flaherty. He's the Vice President and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. He's a Senior Marketing Executive with a passion for sales and marketing integration through effective demand generation. His background includes more than 15 years of experience delivering enterprise-level software solutions, including business process management, IT infrastructure management, business intelligence, intelligence and application development. Say hi to Terry. Hi, Terry. And then we have Bonnie, Bonnie Crater. She is the president and CEO of Full Circle Insights. And she's also a five-time VP of marketing at Genesis, Netscape, Oracle, Stratify, and Voice Objects. While valuing the creative side of marketing, Bonnie's real love is marketing ops, measuring marketing investments and determining investment optimization. Now, as CEO of Full Circle Insights, Bonnie is working to help fellow marketers get the data they need to succeed. Bonnie holds a BA in biology from Princeton University. All right, um, remember, hello, Bonnie. Remember, you can ask all the questions that you want at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to those at the end of the session. And with that, I'm gonna let Terry take it away. Welcome, Terry. Yeah, thanks, Katie. So I thought I'd start by giving you a little bit of a sneak preview into the, the typical sales and marketing meetings that we see. Right? And um, we see three different scenarios if we think about sales and marketing meetings. And these aren't you know, kind of crisis meetings. These are meetings that uh, we want to get together and talk about process, talk about how we're doing. Um, and, and so I did a quick LinkedIn survey a few months ago. We've done a lot of client discussions. And there's really three different scenarios. And the first one is these meetings just don't happen, which is really a shame because, um, you know, it, it, it's really critical. It's really important that sales and marketing are talking about process. They're talking about results. Um, and, and I would say up to half of the time, you know, half of the clients we, we looked at, they, they just don't meet on a regular basis. Um, for those that do meet, one of the things we're seeing is a lot of times they're speaking different languages. They're aiming at different goals. So they meet. But there's still a lot of confusion where, where sales is thinking about you know, deals and revenue and opportunities. Uh, Marketing is often thinking about inquiries and MQLs. And, and there's just a lot of disconnect on um, you know, the marketing team handing off individual silo people and, and sales really interested in pursuing opportunities and deals and buying groups, right? So there's often some big mis miscommunications. But, but the one that, that's probably the most common uh, for those that do need um, that, that's really frustrating and challenging, I think, for a lot of organizations is a lot of times the sales and marketing meetings um, degenerate into chaos, right? And, and that chaos very often is shaped around the conversation that says, you know, hey, you're not following up on the leads that I sent you. Why aren't you following up on these leads? And sales going, the leads you send me stink, right? Why are you sending me these people? They're not on the right profile. They're not engaged or whatever. And so there's very often a lot of finger pointing that occurs in these meetings uh, and they rapidly degenerate into chaos. And, and, and that's one of the, the big things that, that we need to solve and fix. And, and so let's go to the next slide. So, you know, when we have this, 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 this ah, I can't talk this morning, sorry. So when we have this big, big disconnect, uh, either not meeting or having meetings that, that fall into chaos, uh, we wind up with big issues, right? We, we wind up with disconnected goals where, you know, marketing is worried about the number of MQLs they're producing and sales really doesn't care, right? Um, there's often broken processes where people just sit forever, prospects sit forever and don't get followed up on and, and get really disappointed and, and lack and you know, become very disengaged, which leads to poor performance uh, because we're not engaging effectively, we're not communicating effectively to our prospects. 
Um, often, a lot of times, there's just a lack of trust. If, if marketing's coming in saying, look at all these great MQLs, and, and sales looks at it and goes, these are not what I'm expecting, these are not what I need, there's a breakdown in trust. Um, and, and sometimes we've even seen situations where sales is like, I'm going to go build my own demand. I'm going to go source my own demand, create my own shadow marketing department. And we wind up with silos where, where there's a big disconnect between marketing and sales. And, and the, the key in all these things is we're missing revenue. So let's go to the next slide. So what we need um, is this thing we now call revenue council. We've called it a few names over time. It was a demand council, it's waterfall diagnostic council. But th this council really is focused on number one, this talking, right? That's probably the most important thing that sales and marketing can do. And it's, and it's kind of funny because, um, yeah, you would think that it's something that happens all the time, but like I said, it doesn't, and, and it causes a lot of problems. So the big thing is we want sales and marketing to have a regular cadence, a regular discussion. And, and what they need to follow is really a focus on process, right? And so one of the things that you need in order to better align sales and marketing is a clear definition of, you know, what is the process we're following? What are the things we're handing off between sales and the BDR and, and marketing? Um, what's the definitions of these things? What, what's the stages we're following? And, and, and that basically describes what we would consider a waterfall. And so I'm, I'm showing um, our most recent waterfall, if you haven't seen it, is the B2B revenue waterfall um, that's really focused on measuring buying groups and, and opportunities. But whether I'm you know, kind of measuring the, this little bit more modern approach of opportunities and buying groups, or I'm measuring individual leads, either way, right? as long as I have a process, that's a good thing. But what we need to do is talk about the success of this process and how to improve it. right? And that's what this Revenue Council is all about. So the Revenue Council, most importantly, it's a cross-functional team. right? And um, marketing and sales and tele and a few others will look at the members in just a minute, but it's a cross-functional team that's going to get together on a regular basis and, and really focus on process, right? And understand what's working and, and what's not working and how we fix it. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So um, Revenue Council, a couple of features on it that are really important to understand. It's a cross-functional team of a uh, combination of, of leaders in these areas, so marketing and sales and, and uh, operations and, and teleservices. Um, and then also people that understand what's going on in the process. And, and um, it, its whole goal, this whole meeting, right, is not a quarterly business review. It's not looking at sales pipeline. It's looking at the entire process, right, the entire funnel, all the way from who are we targeting, uh, all the way through what kind of engagement are we seeing down to closed revenue, and what's happening across these different stages. So it's a much bigger picture view and a much you know, a, a different important view than what we would see in like a quarterly business review or a monthly sales pipeline forecast, right? So um, yet another meeting, I, I understand a lot of people don't like meetings, but it's really a valuable meeting uh, to be able to step back and look on a recurring basis of what's happening across the entire funnel and are we generating enough to, to feed today's revenue and future revenue. Um, one of the questions I always get is, okay, so I've got you know, multiple different solutions. I've got multiple different geographies. Is it one council that I'm forming, or do I need councils that kind of align to these different go-to-market motions in these different theaters? And, and the answer is it really depends, but, but typically we'll see these councils align to the major go-to-market motions. So I may have a council that is an EMEA for my enterprise software and the US for um, enterprise and SMB or whatever. So it's gonna align to, um, if I have different processes or if I have dramatically different solutions or markets, that I'm gonna have, I'm gonna replicate this council in these different areas. And, and the whole goal, as I said, is, is really around process, right? So we wanna move beyond finger pointing and, and saying, you're not following up on my leads, your, your leads are bad. It, it's much more around, let's look at what we can learn about the process and, and how do we improve it. And, and that because this process, the, the revenue process, it is this cross-functional process that ranges from marketing all the way down to revenue. Um, you know, we, we want this, this group to be a cross-functional group uh, that's really going to focus on understanding what's happening in the process and driving line. Let's go to the next slide. So one of the big questions I always get is who needs to be in this, this council? Who should be in this, right? And um, it is cross-functional. So certainly we want marketing and the teleservices team, the BDR, SDR, RDR team, and the account executives to be a part of it, right? But 
Uh, very often, we also see marketing and sales operations being a key part of it. Um, sometimes product portfolio marketing will be part. Sometimes even finance will come in if they're if they're you know needing to understand what's going on, making investment decisions. Sometimes they're part of this meeting. But what we're looking at when we think about these members, number one, I want representation across all the sub processes in in the waterfall. Um, but I also want um, a, a combination of people that, that really have two insights, right? And one is we, we need people that understand what's really going on in the process today, right? Not what was written down in the process, but have a working knowledge of the insight that's happening today. Because what we're really trying to understand is, you know, what, what's happening and how do we fix it? Um, and, and that second piece, how do we fix it, says I also need somebody that has the political ability to drive change in the organization both in their functional area, but also work across the organization. And so very often it's two people, uh, kind of at a minimum coming from each area. Sometimes it's one. And, and the general size we're looking for is the 10 to 12 range. We don't want it to get super big. The, the bigger the meeting gets, the harder it is to corral and manage it. So yeah, the sweet spot's somewhere in the 10 to 12. It could get a little bit bigger, but we don't want it getting you know, kind of north of 20. Um, and on top of that, then there's going to be subgroups, right? So let, let's say sales and marketing and this council says, hey, we know one of our problems is service levels and we want to go fix service levels. Um, then a subgroup can spawn up, right? And that subgroup could be people from marketing and, and the RDR team uh, who are going to work specifically on, on improving the service level agreements that they have between marketing and teleservices, right? So it's really a combination of kind of a, a, a main core uh, team, if you will. Um, and, and then also some sub teams that spun up to actually do the work. Let's go to the next slide. So if I think about kind of the inputs and the outputs of this council, um, the, the insight that the council needs, the inputs are gonna be uh, really insight on a couple of things, right? And, and one, as you'll see on the agenda, um, one, of the, one of the things we wanna understand is how we do it. Right. And, and how are we doing against goals? How are we doing year over year? So performance data is a really important part of just answering the question of how we're doing, but also uh, helps us understand where there may be opportunities improved. And so that's the whole kind of the goals and the targets or the benchmarks for these different contexts we're looking at. And as I mentioned, the other input is knowledge about what's going on in the process. And, and, and a really important, valuable piece of this is very often the feedback from like the pipeline health review. TBRs, right? So that's a really valid input to this council. And, and, and the council basically is, is really focused on uh, a couple of things, right? One is understanding and, and hopefully um, celebrating the fact that we're meeting our goals, but the bigger focus is, is really on process change, right? And, and so this team is going to work together uh, to look at how we're doing across all these different sub processes within the, within the waterfall. So things like lead scoring and tele and qualification to pipeline and pipeline to close, uh, they're going to look at those different areas in the waterfall, understand where they're above benchmark, where they're below benchmark, where, is, where their likely issues are at, um, and, and then figure out the root cause of what's causing these problems and how we go fix it. Um, and, and, and the beauty of this, or one of the catalysts that makes this successful is uh, it becomes an accountability point, right? So let, let's look at an example. We may I talked about service level agreements earlier, and so we may figure out that uh, you know we've got a service level agreement where we're just not responding to the right level of, of emphasis that we need to for uh, new buying groups, new leads that are coming in, right? And so um, you know we, we may say, okay, we're gonna have a project to go fix the SLAs. That's going to be driven by marketing and the RDR team. And they're going to come back and report to this council and say, you know, we made a decision as a council that we're going to fix the SLAs. We're going to hold you accountable and you're going to come back and report to that. And, that, and that's been really uh, an important aspect because, um, you know, this, this council is basically in the members of the council. We're making promises to the rest of the business on things that are going to, that are going to change. And, and when we see this, when this, this council exists and, and works, right, you, you, number one, increase revenue, obviously. Um, and, and you also gain a lot of efficiency, but probably the most important concept to keep in mind when we think about the, this guidance to this council is that what we're really, what we're really putting in place is a continuous process improvement strategy, right? And so this is not something where, hey, I want to improve the performance of, of my revenue process. Let's go fix it, right? It's never done. The, the, the process um, obviously has many, many moving parts. 
um, I kind of liken it to a chain. There, there's always the weakest link. And so I can drive improvement, but then I can go fix other things that, that you know, may not be critical, but they're still nagging and we can fix them. And, you know, on a regular recurring basis, we always want to see where's my weakest link in this process and let's go fix it. So th this whole approach of having a council that meets together and collaborates really is the, the cornerstone of having a continuous process improvement strategy. Right. And it becomes part of the DNA of the organization to have these really effective aligned uh, meetings to, to focus on the process. All right, let's go to the next slide. So in this meeting, that there's really two different major areas that we're looking at. Right? Uh, and the first I mentioned is just an understanding of how we're doing. And, and so I want to look at um, things like what kind of volume we have at each stage in our process and how efficiently we're converting and how quickly we're converting how we comply against SLA, you know, the SLA requirements and you know, how well we manage the exceptions that occur. And, and Bonnie's gonna spend a lot of time uh, a little bit later um, explaining how Full Circle can help get you great visibility into all these different metrics that are really core uh, to operating your, your demand process or your revenue process, right? But uh, the, the other part that's really important, like I said, is not just how we're doing, but what do we need to fix, right? And so, uh, the, the bigger piece very often in this meeting is around process improvement. Um, and, and very often there's a startup where we're defining, here's the initial projects that, that we're focused on. Um, here's the status of projects we're working. Here's the impact of these projects. Um, and, and once I get this, this um, council in place and get this methodology in place, um, as I mentioned, we're always going to look for, hey, I just fixed, you know, I just finished one project and we fixed the SLAs. Now maybe we need to go look at training or we need to go look at messaging or whatever the case might be, but there's going to be new projects that, that replace the things that we completed, uh, again, as part of this continuous, continuous process improvement strategy. Right, let's go to the next slide. So we have a methodology that we developed at, at Forrester and we have a number of clients that, that implement similar methodologies. Um, where what they want to do is understand as I look at this end to end complex collaborative holistic process, um, we want to understand kind of where we have problems and, and how big those problems are. And so we use a methodology that we call waterfall diagnostics. And, and it's you know, kind of a fancy name for just comparing different stages of the process to understand how we're doing, right? And um, really simple comparison, just looking at here's, here's where we're at. From a conversion perspective, here's what my goal or my benchmark is, um, and I'm either above or below kind of this benchmarking goal. Right? It forms what we call a waterfall performance pattern, uh, but it helps me start to identify where within my process I have issues and where I want to focus. And, and very often, um, you know, we'll start with kind of the areas where we have bigger gaps. Right? So we see prioritize to qualify, that, that's the function of the, the BDR team, right? Um, and we see that's a relatively big gap. So maybe that's where we're gonna initially start out, but you know, we also see that we've got a, a big opportunity for the pipeline to close one conversion rates too. And so um, you know, we, we may do some root cause analysis uh, across both of those different macro processes uh, to understand what's going on and figure out you know, what the issues are that are causing these problems. And we have a methodology uh, that helps organizations do this, but a lot of it is just basic core conversations around what are we doing in this process? What's our service level look like? What's our messaging look like? Uh, do we have nurture capability in place? Are we getting the right lead at this stage? Just a lot of fundamental core questions around uh, kind of the effectiveness of this process at each stage. And, and based on that insight, we're going to pick the, the things that we feel are causing problems in that area. So um, in Tele, for example, we may say, you know what, we have kind of three major areas that we believe are causing problems. One is our service level agreements. Two is maybe our training, right? Then, you know, our, our training maybe is more of an event based. We train when we have a new product release, but otherwise these people are on their own and we need to change that. And we may not have a really good definition of call quality or messaging or whatever the case might be. So, um, you know, this methodology can help you detail and understand what's causing problems within specific areas of the waterfall. And then coming out of that, as we go to the next slide, um, you know, we, we can start to say, well, here's the projects that we're looking at, 
right? And so, uh, you know, we're, we're going to work with, focus on intent. We're going to focus on um, more governor and governance around our SLAs. And, and so these are the major projects that are being tracked uh, within the council. And if we click to the next build, uh, we can also look at details to say, okay, if I'm, if I'm working in intent, here's the things that we need to do with intent, and here's the target, and here's where we are from a process perspective, right? And again, this kind of points to just, number one, classic project management, but number two, um, it, it's a form of accountability back to the group to say, this is the project, here's where I am, here's what I promise I'm going to deliver. Um, and, and that actually has proven out to be probably one of the most important things within this whole concept of having a council. It is just that you know psychological commitment to say, I know where I'm broken, I know what we're going to do to fix. We've all worked together as a team to identify what we're going to fix, and here's the project and the status of the project to actually fix it. So nothing real earth shattering, nothing with major technology, but highly, highly effective. That's okay, you can go to the next slide. So, so one of the questions we always get asked is, uh, okay, cool, we're going to have this council meeting. How often should we do this? Um, and how big should they be? We talked about kind of that 10 to 12 people. Um, and, and so we, we typically see um, a couple phases, right? And, and we have this startup mode where we're creating the council, kind of explaining to the council what it's going to do. Uh, we want to focus on what metrics we want to track. And, you know, we obviously have guidance that we provide around, you want to look at conversion efficiency and velocity and cost and all these things. Uh, but we also then want to collaborate and work on the process diagnostics and understand where the major issues are. And, and more importantly, what are the major issues we're going to address, right? And, and once I have that kind of startup in place, that, it, it kind of varies. It may take a month, a couple of meetings to get this happening. Uh, once I have this in place, then, then what we want is a regular cadence. Um, and, and that cadence, you know, kind of ranges across client base. I see some clients that are doing it quarterly, some that do it monthly. Um, what we recommend is, is, you know, monthly is probably about the right cadence to have this meeting, but I know sometimes it's hard to get marketing and sales in, in the room at the same time. So if all you can do is quarterly, that's way better than nothing. But um, ideally you want to have a monthly meeting for like an hour or so uh, just to talk about these issues and, and prioritize the issues. Um, and, and then you're going to have some teams obviously to go actually do work um, and, and they're going to go do work streams and that's obviously going to be a lot more concentrated um, and they'll complete their task and, and report back to the council that our service levels are fixed or you know we've improved programs with tighter messaging or whatever the case might be right so I, that gives you a general idea there's there's not you know kind of the magic silver bullet but if i was doing a council i aim for probably a, a monthly uh focus on, on on the cadence of what i need all right let's go to the next slide so I want to tell you a client example, and, and, and so this client uh, has been really successful. They just they went through a pretty major transformation uh, starting about a year ago, where where they put this concept of we're going to meet, you know, on a, on a recurring basis. Um, they they put it in place, right? And um, yeah, they suffered like many of you probably have have you know suffered today of just lots of finger pointing, lots of strained relationships in the past, but they recognized that. Uh, communication was really, really critical across this business. And so they've actually implemented a, a couple of different tiers of meetings. Uh, they have a monthly kind of higher level end end process view um, that they focus on. And then they actually uh, wound up with a, a slight variant of what we see. And they created a, a mini council, if you will, uh, because they were making a lot of dramatic changes in, in their BDR, RDR team. Uh, they created a, a mini council uh, that meets even on a more frequent basis um, to, to, to spend a lot of time focusing on how do we improve this process. Um, and, and then they have obviously this, the work groups that meet on a, a regular basis. Um, new update on this. So, so they've seen kind of tremendous growth, you know, 170, 233 percent growth um, in, in the size of their pipeline, the, the number of opportunities they're creating. Uh, I, I just got new data from them for the next quarter, year over year. Um, and amazingly, it's up over 400%, right? And, 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 you know, obviously they've deployed a lot of technology. They started moving to buying groups. They've done a much better job of intent. But what they really focus on, if, if you ask this company, hey, you know, kind of 
what would you attribute your success to? Um, it, it's predominantly the meetings and the fact that we can have conversations. And, and you know, what, what's kind of evolved is, um, you know, a year ago, they weren't talking to each other. A, a year later, um, they, they talk frequently. There's a huge amount of trust. Uh, you know, they recognized that initially the conversations were hard because the, the general tendency was, I'm going to flip it back to finger pointing. And, um, you yeah, they, they came at it with a, an attitude that says, you know, this is not an attack on people. We're going to focus on if, if there's anything to attack, it's our process. And, and, and so let's understand what's going on in the process. Um, there is no sacred cows. There is no blame other than to say these are areas in the process that you can fix. And, and once they got past that, once they understood that, um, that that's when they, they've just seen tremendous success. Like I said, over 400% year over year growth in, in the pipeline and the number of opportunities they're creating is just a tremendous success. Uh, but let's go to my last slide. And well, so so basically they're, they're friends now, I think is the most important thing. So my takeaways, and I'm gonna turn it to Bonnie, right, is um, you know, a revenue management council is a it's a tremendous thing. It, it takes commitment and, and sometimes it's a cultural change, it's a DNA change, uh, but you need to do it because otherwise, if I don't have it, then you know, I'm still laying the seeds for this underlying confrontation, right? So you gotta know where you're going, you wanna you wanna create this cross-functional group. And, and you want to have this cross-functional group meet on a regular occurring basis, recurring basis, um, so that they build trust and more importantly, they build revenue. So I'm going to turn it over to Bonnie. Bonnie's got all kind of great um, insight on kind of software to help drive this council and provide great insight to the council. So Bonnie, uh, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Terry. Um, this, so the one of the issues that I had, um, and we don't have this anymore because we have full circle, is um, is just having data to actually discuss. And um, I'm wondering, Terry, like um, we didn't rehearse this part, but <laughs> I just thought of it. Um, I'm wondering, um, when you look at the companies that you're working with, do they typically have um, kind of multiple multiple levels like that one company you you talked about, or is it is it more like one, one I, council? Yeah, I think they start out as one, right? Uh -huh. and, and then, um, you know, they'll, they'll start expanding out. The, the company that I used as an example started with one, but then kind of realized, um, number one, they, they knew their BDR, RDR team was really broken. So they had to focus a lot on that. So they created kind of a special council for that. Right. Um, and, and then they they still said, okay, we're gonna have kind of a bigger picture view, smaller view. Um, so it really can be kept, you know, customized. The, the key is just conversations. And, yeah. and to your piece, though, um, it, you know, for me to have substantial conversations, it's got to be based or it should be based on data. Yeah. I, I, uh, so folks that are just kind of getting started with this, don't get scared that you have to have three councils. Okay. Right. Right. <laughs> just yeah. start off with one meeting. <laughs> um, I also wanted to interrupt really quick because we've had a few questions about if we'll be sharing the slides and the deck and the recording. And yes, we will be sending that out afterwards. So don't worry about that. You'll get that in your email. Okay, cool. And then, um, can you see my slides? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. Um, uh, so, Terry, thank you so much. Uh, Terry and I have known each other for many years, and you know, these this whole topic of revenue council is a hot topic for me. I've been kind of pitching this for a long time, and um, I wanted to share uh, what our best customers, uh, our best full circle customers, do. Um, and so, um, you'll see. Um, I have this uh, slide's a virtuous circle, but if you start he start here, um, the the sales and marketing teams align on company objectives, and this typically takes the form of a number. Um, uh, and then the the groups uh, these these companies um, who do really well um, adopt funnel metrics and attribution. And what we've been talking a lot about so far is really is funnel metrics. Um, and we at Full Circle we think of these things as two separate things. So funnel metrics is really awesome on process. So we've been talking a lot about process improvement, which is literally half the half the benefit. A lot of, um, of marketing analytics is focused on uh, the notion of attribution, which really uh, talks about how well your uh, your marketing is impacting pipeline and pipeline and revenue. But the combination of these two types of metrics um, is really um, is it really a game changer for many many companies. 
So just as, you know, it's, it's very interesting for me because, you know, Terry and I started talking about this about a few weeks ago, but and I've been talking about this for many years, but I'm having regular meetings between sales ops and marketing ops. And in, in, and in our, um, uh, our customers, it really, a lot of this has to pe depends on the length of the sales cycle, but our best customers, they, even if they have a pretty long sales cycle, they have a weekly meeting. It's not even monthly, it's weekly. Um, and then what they do is every, once a month is they take their findings, right, that they've, that they've been working on, and they actually do an, a meeting with, um, with executives to report on what the findings were and what changes they made and what the results were. But the, in these meetings, um, it's at least sales ops, marketing ops. Typically, there's demand gen or um, head of the telesales or SDRs, um, those types of, types of people in the meeting. Um, sometimes finance comes um, in, for some cases. Most of the time, finance doesn't come, but it just really depends on how your company is organized. But anyway, the, the meetings happen every week, and then um, there's action items that are taken at the meeting, right? And uh, Terry showed some nice charts about doing some project management tracking. And those, those are the kinds of things that these companies do. And then um, they identify areas of improvement, you know, as in the meetings, of course, and then they make adjustments. And this is a really winning formula because, um, you know, I, I've been a, I was, I've been VP of marketing, right? And I know that a good portion of the, of the, uh, of the programs that we ran just didn't work that great, right? Um, and so typically, what we see is about 10 to 30 percent of companies that when they start before they start using Full Circle and then they start using Full Circle and do this process, right, of regular meetings, they find about 10 to 30 percent of programs that they're, they're going to either, you know, significantly change, maybe they change the messaging, maybe they change the channel, or maybe they change something um, to improve it, um, um, or they find um, that the thing isn't working at all. And they basically redeploy the budget into, into the uh, programs that are actually working really well. And so, as you can imagine, if, you're, if you stop spending on things that aren't working well and you put it into things that are working well, it's a game changer. And it, um, you know, we've seen literally, you know, folks like double their productivity um, and efficiency with their marketing dollar. Um, it might have been like same marketing budget this year as last year and like literally getting twice the number of leads, twice the number of deals out of that same marketing budget. So this really works and I totally recommend it. So I wanted to uh, share with you a little bit about um, uh, some of the the, uh, the data that's really helpful and and uh, to do this we you can get a lot of information out of full circle so to simplify that what we did was we uh, we, we we created something we call the full circle method and um, it takes the form of uh, four dashboards so this is uh, the first dashboard is, a, is focused on planning so these are all the metrics to do a reverse waterfall if you're familiar with serious decisions for, forester methodologies, you, you know this in spades, um, to do your planning for whatever the next period. Most of us are doing annual planning, but some of us do semi-annual planning or even quarterly planning. So this is the dashboard that helps you get all the information for that. Then you, then while you're doing planning, of course, you're setting goals. And so um, uh, Terry showed some nice uh, charts which indicated how you would, might want to show whether you're above or below the those goals. So this is uh, takes the form of a, a dashboard, um, uh, the achieving dashboard. Then there's optimizing, which really shows <clears throat> what happens to every lead. This is a key question that I had when I was running marketing is, you know, golly, I, I can't see what happens to every lead. I want to know that. And then lastly is the, our, is the evaluating dashboard. And that really is focused on uh, marketing attribution. This is around budget optimization, right? So you want to know, you know, which campaigns are actually making high contributions, which are low, um, and um, uh, so then you can readjust what your what um, what your spend is. Okay, so same thing for you know, we create a whole new set of dashboards for digital marketing. There's engagement, cost, effectiveness, and revenue impact. So you can see all of that all the way from click to close. Um, I wanted to um, kind of uh, double click a little bit on some examples uh, that you might find yourself in if you have a revenue council or you create a revenue council, what kind of discussions you might have, what might, what might the data look like, and how does the conversation kind of go. Um, it's really important when you create these councils that you kind of set the tone at the very beginning, that this is a collaborative effort 
we're nobody is perfect and we're going the purpose of the meeting is to identify areas where we can make improvements and just uh come in with a very humble mindset um it's so easy to get into the whole finger pointing thing so um it's really important that whoever's leading the meeting has a good handle on all the personalities that are coming into the room and is managing that so that it becomes a productive meeting so um here's a this is a chart it's uh, straight out of full circle but here's a chart that shows worked and unworked QLs. And this could be an opportunity for finger pointing, but if you use it correctly, then you won't. So um, this, the darker shades show the number of worked MQLs. You can see there's a few unworked in this light blue, but over here in this later period, there's a whole bunch of unworked MQLs. So in the meeting, you would say, hmm, I wonder what's going on there. Someone would take the action item to investigate why there are so many unworked MQLs um, and then uh, you would, you know, you would uh, maybe report back the next week. So if you wanted to kind of dig into this uh, by by team, for example, so maybe you have a enterprise mid market and SMB team. So here's another chart which would show, okay, okay, it's it's this mid market team that's maybe has the has the lion's share of the issue around unworked MQLs. So this is all data that's available. Everybody can see it. There's no secrets and um, it's opportunity for improvement. Um, just going back to this, we actually had a customer where they did have this situation where they had an enterprise team, a mid-market team and an SMB team. And the mid-market team um, literally um, was uh, had had a whole bunch of, of um, MQLs that were not worked on. And uh, so the so in this meeting, they basically had to, you know, we're trying to figure out, okay, what the heck happened here? Why are there so many for the mid-market team. And literally what happened is the mid-market team, um, this is the sales team was behind on their numbers. And so they, um, uh, the, the actual leader of that team said, okay, don't follow up on any new uh, leads. Um, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna close all the business that you have in your pipe, but don't follow up on any leads. And so just knowing that this was what was happening and understanding what was going on, that um, actually helped optimize um, and um, uh, optimize the mid-market revenue. So anyway, that was that this is actually a true story. Okay, so um, here's a, uh, this is a very unsexy slide, no pictures here, but you can see these are conversion rates. I, I love this because it gives you a point in time of what the conversion rates are. So this is conversion from uh, qualified lead to sales accepted lead, sales accepted to demo, demo to, to uh, sales qualified lead, sales qualified lead number one, and this is an overall conversion rate. So, um, what? So when you look at this, you, you, one of the conversations in the meeting might be, "Hey, what's going on with demo to SQL? Like, why is it only 15%? If we could, if we could boost up to 30%, that would like really seriously improve our performance." So that kind of conversation could be had, and you can investigate and follow up. Okay, here's another one. Um, this is uh, a, uh, it's actually a chart for attribution, um, but it talks about the opportunity to one conversion conversion rates. Um, and here is, um, this is an, it's an, it, it's influenced conversion rate. So on this X axis here, you'll see zero to 100%. So that, so all the campaigns over here, if you're in Salesforce, you could mouse over and it would pop up what the campaign is. But anyway, all the campaigns, these two campaigns, they were uh, they were they didn't have very many opportunities, but all the opportunities that participated in them won. So that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, here is another camp, you know, so other campaigns that you might want to focus in on, right? Is anything if you draw a line, a diagonal line from here down to the corner here. This you might have this campaign here that you would that you would say, okay, this is we, we want to investigate what is that that's doing so well, or this one here that's that's doing pretty well. What are those? Um, and uh, uh, by doing that kind of investigation, um, it would it um, potentially helps um, understand where you might place more effort or more marketing budget. Okay, so just a couple of additional thoughts. Uh, the first thing is get the right people in the room. I, I worry about meetings that are too big because um, <laughs> it's really hard to organize um, and have good participation, right? Um, you don't want people that are just, you know, w lurking, watching, and not actually participating in the discussion. You want to meet regularly. Okay, so 
even if you did meet monthly, it's better than zero. Um, the third thing is um, is about the approach. So there's a there's a um, a culture of this meeting that needs that needs to be established right from the very beginning of no blame. Right, we're all trying to work on trying to get better. No one is perfect. We can all be better at our jobs. The fourth thing is make sure you take action items and do some good project management around this. The fifth is um, when you take those action items, you want to understand what the correlation or potential causality is. What the data shows, and it shows 100% correlations, it's kind of like when this happens, you see this, right? But it doesn't necessarily um, say why, the, why that particular issue is an issue. So that's what, where the conversations and the, outs the work outside the meeting becomes really important. Then make changes, right? Those, when you make the changes, then measure what happens after the change. So try to figure out the before and after and figure out what, you know, whether that change was effective or not. And so if you do all these things, you will make a bigger impact on your company. Um, I have seen it over and over again. Use the data, meet to discuss it, and make a bigger impact in your company. Okay, so those are my remarks for the moment. Um, I um, wanted to turn this back to Katie for Q&A and maybe have Terry join back up and we can uh, chat it up a bit and take any questions that we might have. Awesome, we do have a few questions. Um, okay. Stephanie asks, which executive is the ideal executive to sponsor and promote this type of counsel? Hmm, that's a really good question. Terry, why don't you try, try your hand up yeah, that? I'll, I'll take a step first. Great. So I, I don't know that it's a magical, hey, it has to be VP of demand or marketing ops, but typically uh, what I'll see is one of those, either the VP of demand or, or the VP of marketing ops, revenue ops, will typically be the chair of the meeting. Um, and, and, and that's probably more driven just because um, you know, sales already says I've got all these meetings I want. They, they don't necessarily need, see the need for this meeting until they actually start participating in it. So um, it, 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 a lot of times the, the, the group that's going to benefit the most from this is marketing just because it helps them understand kind of how do I better integrate with sales and how do I better align with sales. So I'd say, you know, if, if there was one, you know, one or two roles that likely would be the chair, it would be VP demand or VP marketing ops. Yeah, so I, I've mostly seen VP of marketing ops as being the sponsor, but it's actually the meeting happens with sort of director level people. So people that are, you know, can uh, direct and also take action items and then have some resources to, to leverage in order to make progress. Yep. Great. Remember, you can um, type in your questions in the Q&A box if you have any others, but um, I believe you guys covered this, but I, someone asked, um, do you want one council or many councils? Do you see regional councils um, or are they mainly solution specific? Bonnie, you want to start first and then I'll, I'll end. So we tend to see when people first start this to, is to have one council. Um, and sometimes that evolves into having a second, a second one. Um, they um, and there's lots of different names for this meeting. Um, so it's not always called revenue council. It might be called something else. You like, you all out there might have, you know, be running this meeting and and uh, call it something else. But um, oftentimes it takes does take a regional focus. So, for example, if you have a marketing team that's really focused on North America and then you have a separate one that's focused on, you know, demand gen uh, in Europe, you might have a, sec a second separate one because really the marketing uh, team, the North American market team is not really doing anything and doesn't really understand the European market or maybe the Asia, Asia Pacific market. So you probably have a separate, um, separate regional, um, uh, separate, separate regional council. What do you think, Terry? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it's uh, often geography is the first starting point, right? Because things are different enough in different countries where you know, they want to have this insight. Um, I, I sometimes see it by solutions too, right? Where um, you know we, we have different solutions that we're tracking, and and I, and I think the key, right? The the, the thing that makes it you know, an identification says, hey, I need another council. It's just if my process is significantly different, if my conversion rates are significantly different, if my market's different, uh, then it's worth having a, a separate council. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Okay. Um, this is another one. How big should my revenue council be? What size is the best? Yeah, I, I think we touched on this. I, I would aim for... Um, 
in the 10 to 12 range. I've, I've seen some that get bigger, but as Bonnie said, right, the the, the bigger your mean gets, the harder it is to manage. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm like five or six at most. That's what I would yeah. say. But anyway, yeah. Terry and I well, and I only agree on this point. <laughs> Five or six is, you know, if we're really bringing in operations and sales and marketing and tele, whatever, just what we wind up with just, you know, even if I had one person per service area, functional area, that still gets me at six. And, and um, you know, so, sometimes I, th I think the challenge is that it's that balance of, I, I want people on the council to really understand what's going on, right? I don't want somebody, it's like, oh, this is the process we defined three years ago and, and things in reality aren't working that way. So you need somebody that has the insight. But but the other piece I think that I think is critical is you know, these are people that are signing up or, or you know telling the rest of the organization we're going to go make this successful. So that person has to have the account have the political um, power to go make change also. You know, mm -hmm. and so that's why sometimes it's kind of double right of two two people coming from the same group. Uh, one rep represents kind of status quo and the other one represents that, that we're going to go make change. Yeah, so I think the sponsorship part about this is really important is like is, you know, make sure your VP, CMO, you know, they're totally on board with this. And it also helps to engage on on a regular basis with a more with the more senior leadership with the VP level leadership if you are a director kind of level. Um, and because it engages them in the work that you're doing and then also increases the sponsorship, especially as you make progress, because literally. And everybody I see that does this makes significant progress. It's it's really a great process. Great. Um, you sort of touched on this, but do the teams always need to be cross-functional? Like, do I need sales on my council if it's discussing marketing stuff? Um, it says, so why do I need... Yeah, go ahead. So, so, so my view is... Um, yeah, we want it to be cross-functional, right? And, and even if the topic of the month is looking at, you know, things going on with marketing or tele, um, these are leaders in the organization that are, are going to work together to produce revenue, right? And, and so I think the leaders need to understand, um, to some degree, maybe not super detailed, but to some degree, they need to understand, here, here's all the moving parts that can impact revenue, right? Uh, and, and they need to understand it because we're going to ask this group to start to prioritize. And you know, we may come back with a short list that says, you know, I've got three things I can do in scoring and prioritization, and I've got a few things we can do in tele, and I've got a few things we can do in sales ability, get stuff in the pipeline and pipeline to close. So let's say there's you know 10 potential projects that all look like they're gonna deliver some value, right? Um, it, it's not likely we're gonna have the budget to do all 10. And, and we're not gonna have the manpower to do all 10. So we have to make some decisions to say, yeah, there's 10 things we want to fix over the course of time, but let's prioritize. And these are the three that we're going to prioritize. And, you know, what we don't want back to kind of this open communication and collaboration, what I, what I don't want is marketing getting upset because the changes we're making are the sales or vice versa, right? We want everybody to understand kind of these are the parts that we're going to fix right now. These are the parts we're going to defer to the next quarter or whatever. Um, and, and, and so I think number one, it's, just, it's really super healthy to have um, the leaders in this organization focused on revenue to understand the major functions of these processes. Um, and, and it's just, you need all points of view and, and ultimately being able to make the decision on what is it we're actually going to invest in. So, so I think it has to be cross-functional. Yeah, and, and I would say this meeting does not work if you don't have salespeople in it. Like yeah, it just absolutely. doesn't work. Like don't do it. That's just a marketing meeting. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Okay, one more question. Um, does finance have a role in the Revenue Council? Yeah, it can. Um, depending, it depends on how your budgeting cycles work um, and how closely you work with finance. But it actually could increase um, the, the, the working relationship and improve the working relationship between marketing and finance. If they're, um, you know, when you're working with finance folks, you know, they tend to, you know, they tend to be very detail oriented and like, they want to know like what happened to this money that was spent, right? That's that's the whole idea. And so um, uh, by actually um, getting them involved, you know, in a regular regular meeting, um, it can help them understand the decisions that you're making and actually build confidence um, in the finance team in in what you're actually doing. So that's my take. How about you, Terry? 100% agree. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's going to be easier for them to give you money if they know why you're asking for money. Right? And if and if they've been part, even tangentially, they've been part of the decision, then you know, they're going to fund it because they understand exactly the reason that 
the, the, the why we're asking as opposed to just saying, hey, I need two hundred thousand dollars, so we're going to make things better. No, now they understand that two hundred thousand dollars is meant for improving our training processes or whatever the case might be. So yeah, yeah. yeah finance will come. It's great to have. Yeah, and, and understand that the connection between the activity, the expense, and then what the expected result is. If they're yep. in this meeting, they'll get it and they'll be able to be an advocate for you. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you both. This is the this is wrapping up our webinar. We appreciate everyone for joining. I'm going to be sending out the slides and the recording after this. So look out for that in your in inbox. Thank you so much, Terry and Bonnie. This was great. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks. See ya.